everyone. I'm going to get started because, and I say this every time I know I say this every time because it's on a recording. <laughs> you don't want to hear from me. You want to hear from our guest speaker, our distinguished guest speaker, Dr. Judith May. So uh, today, uh, the her title is Genomics of Sex-Specific Phenotypic Variation. But before um, we listen to the talk and I give out her bio, I just want to recognize that we live, work, and play and participate in a community on the unceded, ceded, and traditional territories of the 203 First Nations, along with 38 Métis chartered communities, each of which possess their own unique traditions and history on the land that we now refer to as British Columbia. We acknowledge the importance of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada's call to action, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, and the BC's Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People Act. In all of our work, we are committed to ensuring Indigenous women's rights to health and safety and the equal opportunity to participate in a manner that recognizes and respects Indigenous cultures and traditions. Uh, today, I'm actually joining you from Toronto, but uh, normally I'm in Vancouver, which is part of the unceded homelands of the Coast Salish peoples and the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. Um, and with that, I'll tell you just very briefly about the Women's Health Research Cluster, because um, we might have some different uh, people here on the call today. Uh, our cluster is over 400 members. Uh, a lot of them from uh, University of British Columbia, but not all. In fact, we're worldwide. We think there's 18 uh, countries now represented. Uh, we run a number of events. There's one right now uh, ongoing on uh, the effects of hormonal contraceptives on, on women's health, uh, particularly brain health. So if you are interested, please um, take a look at that. We run um, a number of uh, blogs, a podcast. There are a number of trainee travel awards. So if you do any work in SGBA or in women's health, um, please do um, apply for them because our uh, success rates are very high. And of course, we thank our sponsors uh, without which uh, support uh, we couldn't uh, do this series. And if you'd like to become a member, please do so. Now, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can actually hear from um, our speaker, Dr. Judith May, um, and I will give it her bio while she's uh, and her fun fact. Uh, Dr. Judith Mink received her BA from the University of Florida, her master's from Pennsylvania State University, and uh, her PhD from the University of Georgia. She is the recipient of the Dobzeniski Prize from the Society for the Study of Evolution and the Scientific Medal from the Zoological Society of, of London. Holy moly, did you get a real medal? Yeah, I did. I can show it to you sometime. Yes, please. I want to see that. Uh, Dr. Mink is currently a professor. You can tell I read these beforehand. Thank you. Uh, a professor in zoology at the University of British Columbia and a Canada 150 research chair in evolutionary genomics. Her lab is interested in understanding how selection produces variation in form, behavior, and reproductive patterns. And much of her work is focused on sexual dimorphism and sex chromosome formation. So a topic that I don't know a lot about, but I'm so excited to learn. And I'm certain that many of you here are also excited to learn. And um, I always, you know, that, you know, learning that she has medals and all this stuff is really important to put a human face uh, to uh, the hardware. And uh, Dr. Mank uh, had, gave me a fun fact and um, then asked for another fun fact. And I found out that she plays the French horn, which is pretty awesome. Uh, but even maybe more awesome is that she knits for her dash hound because she can't find proper fitting clothes for her dash hound. And uh, she shared a picture, but I will not share it with you because it's too awesome. Um, so without, with that, uh, please take it away, Dr. Bill. Thanks, Lisa, for that really enthusiastic welcome and introduction. Let me go ahead and share screens. Can you guys see some guppies swimming around? We yeah. can, yes. Okay. Yeah. So, I'm going to admit right now that I don't work on anything that's directly relevant to human health, nor do am I going to talk about uh, either human females or, or animal females. Um, so if you guys want to sort of bail out, I totally understand right now, and I'm not actually looking at how many participants are leaving in droves. I'm gonna talk about some work that we've been doing in these species. These are common guppies. 
um, and some related species looking at uh, the Y chromosome. And that's relevant, I hope, to you guys because it's a way to understand sex differences in phenotypic variation. Um, so if you just do the converse, many of this is relevant to the female side of things. It's just that males and guppies are slightly more visually um, attractive. They're the, the small colorful ones swimming across your screen. The females are the big dull colored ones just kind of slowly swimming around like big Cadillacs. Um, so for those people who work on model systems um, in mammals and flies, um, it may be a bit surprising that sex chromosomes are actually an enduring mystery. So this is um, a figure that I was part of a working group for several years called the Tree of Sex Consortium. It sounds much more interesting than it really was. And we were trying to just map out the incidence of different mechanisms of sex determination. And if you look at the vertebrates, there are some clades like mammals and birds where they have sort of a single origin of a sex chromosome system that's then been conserved for 100 or 200 million years. But outside those groups, you get the rapid origin turnover and even loss of sex chromosomes. So if you look at the reptiles outside of snakes, amphibians and fish, you get this rapid change in the mechanism of sex determination. And it's so rapid that we aren't actually sure how many times sex chromosomes have evolved independently. And the, so the X and the Y or the Z and the W, they diverge from each other once recombination between them is halted. And the reason that recombination is halted is, is also a bit of a mystery. Um, but what's relevant today is that that's what drives this divergence. And that can be really problematic for the Y chromosome because once it stops recombining with the X, it's no longer recombining at all. So the X is still recombining in females and regions of low or, or no recombination experienced a, a vast reduction in the efficacy of selection. So selection is less able to maintain gene activity and it's far less able to purge deleterious mutations and, and premature stop codons. So you get this really rapid loss of gene content from the non-recombining Y. And that leads to dosage imbalances between males and females. So for every gene that's lost from the Y, males only have one functional remaining copy on the X, as opposed to the two copies in females. And gene dose isn't a perfect predictor of expression level, but it's a pretty good one. And so this could re result in, in reduced expression of many genes, which is problematic for dosage sensitive or, or haploinsufficient genes. And the thing to remember is that this process, this recombination suppression and degradation is totally unnecessary. So there are ways to determine sex without genetic differences. You can do it by temperature, you can do it by demography, all sorts of things. But if you wanna do it genetically, as an example, sex in the puffer fish is determined by a single SNP, one non-synonymous polymorphism in the puffer fish in the gene AMHR2 makes you a male. Um, if you're a wild type homozygous, you develop as a female. If you have one copy of the SNP, you develop as a male. Otherwise, the X and the Y are completely identical and there's no evidence of recombination suppression. You could argue this is just a really young system. So recombination takes a while to build up, we think. Degradation of the Y also takes a while. So um, there was sort of a, an initially an idea that maybe systems that had very little divergence were very young. That's clearly not the case. So Nicolas Perron showed over 10 years ago that hyla tree frogs have an old system that's con conserved throughout the genus, but it's largely undifferentiated. So time is not a great predictor of degeneration of the Y. And so we know now that undifferentiated sex chromosomes need not be young. But there has been sort of this persistent assumption that highly differentiated sex chromosomes must be old, right? It takes time for these processes to develop. And that's consistent with what we see in mammals and birds. Those are old systems, they're highly diverged. And this is something that we kind of inadvertently started working on about 10 years ago um, in this system. So this is guppies. So if you have guppies or had them as a kid, Pacilli reticulata at the top, um, that's, that's probably what you had. Um, you probably had a fancy guppy. This is a picture of the wild type from uh, Trinidad. Um, and it's closely related to lots of other species, some of which we know a little bit about their sex chromosomes. The reason, one of the reasons we started working on guppies is that they were actually the original model system for Y chromosomes about a hundred years ago. So Orion Binga was a Danish geneticist. Uh, he mostly worked on yeast, and I think he kept a couple tanks of guppies, just mostly as pets in the lab. 
And he mapped out the inheritance of different male coloration patterns um, across relatively short pedigrees and identified many that seem to be Y-linked. So they were inherited perfectly from father to son. And that's what I've circled here. Um, that uh, work was read by uh, Ari Fisher, who started thinking more about Y chromosomes. And he predicted that Y chromosomes, in addition to a sex determining gene, might accumulate genes with male specific effects. And that began our whole theoretical understanding of sex chromosomes and how um, they originate. So I'm going to tell you a story in three parts, and I'm happy to, inter uh, to be interrupted and answer questions. I can't see everybody, so if there's a hand raised, could um, Lisa, could you interrupt me so that I can answer anything as we go? Will do. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to tell you a story in three parts. We'll see how far we get. So I'm going to talk about some comparative genomic framework uh, that we've been doing to look at sex chromosomes and guppies. I'm going to talk about some phenotype work that we've been doing to try and understand the role of the Y chromosome in male color. And then I'm going to tell you a really fun natural history case about one species that we've been working on that has five different types of males, all of which are controlled by different Y chromosomes. Um, so as I said, guppies are, are the original model. Um, we sort of, they fell out of use for a lot of reasons. I think they're slightly ridiculous for a model system and that's why people don't take them as seriously, but they've been a longstanding ecological model. Um, they have a variety of sex determining systems in the clay. So um, primarily Manfred Chartle has mapped out uh, the karyotypes for sex chromosomes in several of these species. And that's what I'm showing in the parentheses here. So that was sort of what was known when we started this around 2012, 2013. Um, Christina Dreyer had mapped out, she did a linkage map in guppies um, quite some time ago and showed that the, the male determining region is at the distal end of chromosome 12. And beyond that, there wasn't a whole lot known. Um, so the first question we asked was how old are the sex chromosomes? And, and Menford Shuttle had shown that uh, he had, his karyotype work suggested that the X in reticulata and in this closely related sister species, Wingii, was probably ancestral. So we, we knew that it was probably shared between these two species being fish, um, and with that rapid turnover, we assumed that it was probably unique to that clade. So that was sort of our working assumption. And at the time, there was no reference genome um, for guppies. There weren't a lot of resources, period, in fish. And so we had to develop a pipeline for identifying sex chromosomes from different types of genomic data. And almost everything I'm going to talk about uses this basic pipeline with various types of data. So the data varies, but the approach is relatively same. So we sequence multiple males and females. Um, and then we put together the female reference genome. And the reference genome is always specific to the population that we sequence. That actually turned out to be more important than we expected. And so this is an XY species. We're assembling the X, but not the Y. And to that, and then we take those scaffolds um, or those contigs and map them to the nearest available chromosome level reference genome. And that gives us positional um, information and the orientation of how those scaffolds are arranged. And to that, we then map our short bead male and female data, so the, the population-based approach. And there are two things that we're looking at. So we're looking at coverage differences, so how many reads are mapping in males compared to females, and the SNP density compared it comparing males to females. And there's sort of three patterns that emerge from this. So for an autosome or a region of the sex chromosomes that's still recombining, everybody is the same. Males and females have two copies of the chromosome and they're swapping SNPs back and forth through recombination and independent segregation. And so your coverage and your SNP density will be exactly the same between males and females. Where the Y has started to diverge, but hasn't really degenerated yet, those reads from the Y will still map. They still are quite similar to the X. So they'll map to the female reference genome in the same amount as the two copies of the X1 well, females, but you'll have the buildup of Y specific SNPs that are being passed from father to son and are never present in females. So your SNP density will be higher in males compared to females in sort of young or recently diverged regions of the chromosome. And when the Y is degenerated, um, those reads will no longer effectively map to the X, either because they're so divergent, they can't, or they've been deleted and they don't exist anymore. And so in those regions, you'll see a reduced male-female coverage. So these are the three patterns that we sort of expect to see based on how different the Y might be from the X. 
And Pedro Amino was a postdoc in the lab who was working with, we had linked read data from 60 males and 60 females taken from three streams, multiple populations across the island of Trinidad. Um, and he was building on some work that Alison Wright, uh, a previous postdoc had done. And I'm showing you here, male coverage in blue and female coverage in red in the first plot. And you can see that there's two regions of chromosome 12 where the male coverage seems to drop. We actually think that these are contiguous on the Y. Remember we're mapping to the X and there seems to be an inversion on the X compared to the Y. So we think these two drops are actually physically linked to the, each other on the X chromosome. In that region, we have the accumulation of male specific SNPs. And so in a region where recombination has been suppressed between the X and the Y for a long enough period of time, we would expect the Y haplotypes, um, and we had linked read data, so we could actually phase the X and the Y reads in males. We'd expect the Y haplotypes to cluster separately from the X, and that's just a function of, of time. Um, and, and uh, complete linear sorting. And we saw that as well in this region. We also saw a buildup of male specific sequence. I'm not gonna show you that because it's a little bit messy, but it was exactly in the same region. And Yulia Doralti was a, she did this as a grad student uh, with me. She set up families of Reticulata and Endler's guppy, Vasilia Winyai. And remember we expected these to have a sex chromosome that was ancestral. And she uh, mapped SNP segregation from fathers and mothers to sons and daughters to identify what was Y-linked and what was X-linked. Um, and then figured out the gene sequence for those SNPs um, and built phylogenies for all the coding sequence that we recovered um, across these families. And she found four loci, four genes, just four, that showed uh, phylogenetic clustering based on chromosome, where the two Y chromosomes and the two species clustered more closely together than the X chromosome. And that's consistent with ancestral recombination suppression in the ancestor of these two species. And those four loci were exactly in these regions. Um, and this is consistent with, the, with what we expected that Reticulata and Winyai had an ancestral sex chromosome that was relatively small. There's very little differentiating the X from the Y in these species, so little that we had no evidence that the Y copy has actually um, diverged significantly from the X in terms of gene function or gene activity. Um, and just to be tidy, she actually wanted to, to figure out exactly where the sex chromosomes evolved. So we expected it to be in this branch here, um, but she had a whole series of outgroups that she wanted to sort of see if, if they shared anything, if there was anything going on. I didn't expect it. Um, again, with fish sex chromosomes, they turn over very, very rapidly, sometimes within species who have multiple sex chromosomes types competing. Um, and she was sort of uh, tasked with this immediate question of how do you orient uh, your scaffolds uh, without increasing bias with phylogenetic distance? So if we actually built reference genomes for all these species and oriented the scaffolds to the reticulata genome, the further you get away, the, the messier it becomes, the more changes there have been between them and the increasing phylogenetic bias you get. And so she eventually settled on a program called RACA, Reference Assisted Chromosome Assembly. And RACA works by essentially using an in-group and an out-group that between them completely bookend all your, your species of interest. So no matter where you are between them, the total distance between the two is exactly the same. So this gets rid of this phylogenetic bias issue. Uh, we use Evolferus um, heleri and Orizius letopes as our, our two in-group and out-group species. And she built reference genomes for all the other species based on that. And I'm showing you here just the male-female coverage in the first column and the male-female expression. So this is the moving average of expression in males and females across chromosome 12, the sex chromosome in Reticulata and Winyai. You can see in Reticulata, there's this little dip in coverage between males and females. It's a little bit more in Reticulata, um, and that's consistent with the karyotype evidence. She also found evidence of a second par at the far end of the chromosome, and that's where 99.99% of recombination between the X and the Y happens. Um, this whole region to the other side is, recombination is very, very rare there. What we didn't expect was that in the next group out, Pacilia picta, which has the unlovely name of the swamp guppy, um, we would have essentially, it's, it's the same sex chromosome. Chromosome 12 is also the sex chromosome. What was even more, uh, and that suggests that the sex chromosome is older than we thought, at least 20 million, maybe 40 million years old, somewhere in that interval. 
And while reticulata and wingii have very little difference between the X and the Y, the Y is almost completely gone in Pacilia picta. Um, and this is a, a level of divergence that we haven't really seen in a fish species before. Uh, so that was surprising. What was even more surprising is that there was no difference in expression between males and females. So remember, the Y is almost completely gone, and yet males are expressing their single X copy at the same level as females on average. And for people who work on mammals, that's not surprising. For people who work on anything else, it is. Um, and so as the X and the Y diverge from each other, as I said before, um, the Y starts to degenerate and more and more of the X, this is sort of time, um, becomes uh, present in one copy in males. And in the absence of some mechanism to deal with this, this leads to a dosage imbalance, right? So dose is not a perfect predictor of expression, but it's pretty good. And so on average, having gene dose results in a point, you know, about a 60% drop in expression. Um, some organisms have come up with mechanisms to completely um, uh, regulate the entire X chromosome uh, to deal with that dosage imbalance. We call that complete dosage compensation. That happened once, maybe twice, um, in either the ancestor, the therians, and the placentals, um, or in each of those lineages separately. And it's happened in a nolus. So those are the only two instances of complete dosage compensation in vertebrates. In all the other species that have been assessed thus far, they have what's called incomplete dosage compensation. So on average, the heterogamete expre sex expresses the sex chromosome less. Uh, those with sensitive genes may be compensated, but overall they manage. Um, and this is actually present in some systems that have really big differences between the sex chromosomes of so birds. And um, there's big differences between the Z and W and they do not have uh, complete Z chromosome dosage compensation. So we didn't expect any mechanism um, of dosage compensation at all. And so Yulia started really digging into her data. So she looked at all the genes that were expressed from the X um, in males and 25% of those were heterozygous. And that's much, much less than the genomic average from the autosomes of about 70%. That's consistent with widespread loss of gene activity from Y genes. Of those that did maintain um, heterozygosity in males, we saw a really strong allele specific expression. So I'm showing you here um, the major allele ratio. So this is the, the ratio where you have a SNP in a coding sequence of where the, the more common allele is expressed, how often it's expressed. Most genes have a major allele ratio of about 0.6 and that's consistent with cis regulatory variation. Uh, you get some, sorry, males are on the, the first column, females are on the right. Um, autosomes are in gray, sex chromosomes are in gold ahead of it. You can see that um, in reticulata and wingii, males and females, the major allele ratio for almost everything is 0.6. You get some strong imprinting, you get this little bump at the side, um, but overall the sex chromosomes look like the autosomes in males. When you look at Pacilia picta at the bottom, you can see there's this major shift on the sex chromosome. The major allele ratio approaches about 0 0.8, 0 0.95, uh, 0.85 to 0.9. And that's also consistent with those genes that are still expressed, but they've lost a lot of their gene activity. Their expression level is much less on the Y compared to the X. And despite that, the average expression of the X in males in PICTA is statistically equivalent uh, to the X in females and the two autosomes in males. And that only happens with functional complete dosage compensation. It's the first case of chromosome level dosage compensation in a teleost and only the third case that's been shown in vertebrates. And this got very exciting. So if I fill in our tree here, we've got reticulate and wingii with a little bit of um, a divergence between the X and the Y, a little bit more in wingii. No need for dosage compensation because there's no degeneration. And then one species out, we've got picked up, same sex chromosome, extensive degeneration and complete dosage compensation. Ben Sankam was working on this weird little species I'm gonna talk about at the end if we have time called Basilia peri. Um, it's a close relative of Picta or closer. And he very quickly put together the reference genome and noted um, a Picta-like pattern of degeneration. And Dave Metzger has been interested in epigenetic um, uh, and epigenomic uh, patterns. He looked at expression levels and noted that they had complete dosage compensation. 
Um, and so they seem to be very similar to Pacilia picta. Um, we've also been working on bifurca, which is this little species here, which is actually very difficult to keep. And that's why this is still in progress. We haven't quite gotten there yet. But when you do uh, maximum parsimony analysis, and we've actually got quite a bit of data to support this now, this phylogeny is consistent with the idea that the sex chromosome system originated with a very small non-recombining region somewhere between 40 and 20 million years ago. In one clade, there's been very little change since then. And in the other, you have the evolution of dosage compensation and rapid Y degeneration. And the thing that's really weird about this is that it's actually really hard to compensate an X chromosome. It's really complicated. So if you think through it, you have to coordinate regulation across a large chromosome. So the X is the 12th largest of 20 some chromosomes. It's not small by any means, it's about average. It can't bleed over substantially to other chromosomes because you could screw up transcriptional regulation across a huge chunk of the genome that way. And the mechanism needs to be sex specific. And so we started trying to understand how dosage compensation works in this species, Bacillia picta, and how it could possibly evolve so freaking quickly in just this, this short three and a half million year interval. That seems sort of not possible. And this is something that Dave Metzger has been picking up. And so he has. He has, um, he actually worked with Dovetail to build a, a really good reference genome, not one of our kind of, you know, quick and dirty ones. Uh, so it's a really complete female reference genome. He has a transcriptome, so RNA data, and he also has um, methylation data, uh, looking at sort of CPG methylation. And he went through a series of tissues and and confirmed that we have dosage compensation, but it's largely confined to the soma. Uh, so in the species that have complete sex chromosome dosage compensation, it almost never works in the gonad. Um, and that's consistent with what we're seeing. So the testis is actually expressed less, the X testes genes are expressed less than the ovary and less than the autosomes on average. He also noted that chromosome 12, the sex chromosome, is hypomethylated in the male soma and to some extent in the testes, um, but much, much more so in the soma. And that's consistent with maybe the X chromosome having a, a more open uh, physical structure to be more amenable, uh, easier for the transcriptional machinery to bind to it. The differentially methylated regions, so the regions that are differentially methylated between males and females in the soma, and this was really surprising, were the, the motif that they were the most associated with, the p-value was an order of magnitude higher, is for YY1, uh, this YY1 motif. And that sort of ringing alarm bells very quickly. So YY1, or yin yang one is involved in X inactivation in mammalian dosage compensation. And I'm not making a case here at all that it's a conserved mechanism between mammals, Perry, because there are a lot of species that don't have sex chromosomes in between and none of them have dosage compensation, but it seems to be convergent evolution. So Huawei one seems to be acting in a very similar manner um, across these, these two clades, which are, are very, very distant. And that YY1 motif is enriched on the species that have dosage compensation. So pick them, we have kind of a very, poor reference genome for peri, but we see the pattern as well. And it's absent in, in species that lack um, dosage compensation. And as I said before, male hypomethylation occurs in areas that are immediately proximate to YY1. So that's what I'm showing you here. So uh, males in blue, females in red, the soma in the solid and the dash line um, have much lower methylation in males. Um, in the immediate proximity of that YY1 motif. So YY1 is, is we think, acting sort of through these transcriptionally active associated domains, TADs, uh, to regulate the entire chromosome in males. And that led to the question of how is the YY1 motif spread throughout the X chromosome? And the first thing you think of when you think about a quick spread of a motif for TEs, transcriptional, um, sorry, transposable elements, so they're sort of an ideal mechanism to perfuse a specific sequence very quickly throughout the genome. And Dave pulled out 
all the transposons that were annotated in his reference genome that have um, X that the, that had the the YY one motif, and he built the phylogeny, and that's what I'm showing you here. Everything's color coded by chromosome. This is just a phylogenetic relationship of those TEs, and he found three clades in green, three different shades of green that were largely confined to the X chromosome, so that motif was profusing through the X. Um, and it was happening very, very quickly. Um, so if you look at the branch lengths of those X-bearing clades, they're very, very short, suggesting it's very, very recent, the spread of these YY1-bearing transposable elements. And so the working model is that the spread of the YY1 motif across the X chromosome through these transposons has left the X chromosome sort of littered uh, with YY1 motifs which are um, hypomethylated, so they're unmethylated in males, and that allows YY1 to bind to them. And that, through some mechanism we're not sure of, is how um, the X is hypertranscribed in males and dosage compensated. They remain methylated in females, those motifs, so YY1 does not bind, and they don't affect overall transcription. Uh, which is what I've just said. So this process um, has allowed for a really rapid spread of the YY1 motif and the evolution of dosage compensation in less than 4 million years. Um, and there's sort of one element here that I think is really interesting. So demethylation of YY1 in mammals is associated with transposon proliferation. And so it's possible that this demethylation of the YY1 motif in males on the X results in a positive feedback loop where you've got further spread of that transposon throughout the Y chromosome. But that's something that we need to sort of figure out as well. So are all highly differentiated sex chromosomes old? The answer is no. So Pasilia Picta has showed us that sex chromosomes can rapidly evolve complete dosage compensation and Y degeneration. And we're not sure the order. Um, if dosage compensation came first and that relaxes pressure to maintain gene in integrity on the Y and that can be lost or Rapid loss of genes from the Y leads to a really strong selection for dosage compensation. Um, so that's sort of the first story. The second one is just a phenotype story. So it's the role of the Y chromosome in male color. And one of the reasons that guppies have been such an ecological model is that they show this enormous variation in male coloration, much more so than any population genetics model can explain. And moreover, Binga showed us that many of those appear to be Y-linked. They're passed perfectly from father to son. And these were done on relatively short pedigrees. And if you eyeball enough guppies, you realize that these patterns are actually quite hard to delineate from one another. But this initial work was really, really sort of key because Y chromosomes don't recombine. And that means that they're characterized by purifying selection and selective sweeps. And that means that they have very, very little variation um, overall. And this level of Y diversity, so all these fish that I've circled in orange were present in Vinga's relatively small lab population. This level of Y diversity is really puzzling. And so Jake Morris picked this up and he developed a, a method to take a high res photo of a guppy and extract the pixels and cluster them so that the computer could essentially identify ornaments. And, and this was really important because as I said, it's quite hard to eyeball a fish and to decide what kind of pattern he has to sort of create um, distinct patterns uh, with it. So this was quite nice. Um, and it removed a lot of the female bias, or not the female, the human bias in that. Um, and I'm just gonna talk about the orange today. So he found four orange ornaments, and those again at 01 through 04, and I've shown them on the fish, and these are present in relatively high proportions in our lab population. And he asked the question if they're Y linked. And the old fashioned way of doing this is to set up pedigrees, which is what he did. So we set up four families, each with four different color patterns and all these different ornaments. And if something is Y-linked, that, that pattern will be passed perfectly from father to son to grandson. Um, and when we looked at that, I'm showing you here the four different orange ornaments and their proportion in the pie charts that were the same as the dead, potentially Y-linked or different in gray. You can see that none, neither one, two or three showed a pattern consistent with Y-linkage. Maybe orange ornament four, um, it wasn't really clear. But what he did see was that there were really strong correlations for size and saturation in these ornaments. So if uh, 
an individual had a really big orange ornament one, all the other orange ornaments would be really big. Or if they were, if one was really vivid, all the other ornaments, all the other orange ornaments on a male fish would be really, really vivid. Um, and that suggests a modifier locus that's affecting multiple ornaments in the same biochemical pathway. And when he looked at the correlation in total orange area and total orange saturation in the correlation between a grandson and his paternal grandfather with whom he shares a Y, uh, that correlation was much, much stronger than it was between a grandson and his maternal grandfather with whom he does not share a Y. And that's really consistent, sorry, with the idea of a Y-linked modifier locus. So we don't see this Y diversity so much in color, but it seems to be affecting um, overall uh, size and, and saturation of the ornaments. And that's a little bit more reasonable, um, to be honest. Walter Vanderbilt, um, as his pandemic project, um, decided that he was going to build on this substantially. So he sampled 100 males from our lab population, photographed them, selected the 30 most orange and the 30 least orange, mated them to virgins, um, did the same for their kids, um, across three selection lines, uh, three selection generations. And he did this in uh, three replicates. So we have three up selected and three down selected lines. Um, and what was really amazing about this is that he took these photographs as well. And he actually used a neural net to both outline the fish and extract the color patterns. Um, and he, it, the neural net after training did it much better than a human could and much faster as well. And so he was able to phenotype almost 3,000 males and he took multiple photographs from each side. So more than 12,000 photographs in total. You get something like this, these wiggling fish. Um, so each of these is one fish and these are all the photographs of the same fish um, he's wiggling through. So it's a little bit of variation, but not, not too bad. Um, and we've got controlled pedigrees for these. Um, and so we can see how orange responds to selection. And I'm showing you the up-selected lines from the original population in red. The down selected lines in green and, and lineage is shown with the lines going through the distributions. And you can see over the three selection generations, we get a lot more orange total coloration. Orange, uh, it decreases a little bit on the down selected lines, but there's sort of a, a lower limit. And you can look at local heritability um, for each pixel on the fish. Um, and you can see that you know, there seem to be areas where there's relatively high heritability um, and areas of relatively low heritability. You can also parse this into different parts of the genome. So the X chromosome seems to carry the locus uh, controlling this trait at the top of the tail. There's some Y heritability um, for these traits at the front of the fish near the gill, but it's much, much lower. Most of the heritability is autosomal. You can look at specific ornaments um, and total heritability in black and then the sex linked heritability. So the X in red and the Y in Blue. And you can see that for almost all ornaments, uh, Y heritability is very low, except for this, this one right under the gill arch. And that's orange ornament four from Jake's study. So that's consistent with what we were seeing before. And because he's actually got a neural net doing this, he can actually look at sort of color space. Um, so he can look at how total patterning in fish fits within sort of total pattern space. And each one of these dots is a different fish and its relationship to all the other fish he's looked at. And you can look at total orange heritability. Uh, so the total pattern heritability, and it's about 0.8, a little bit higher. Um, and when you separate that uh, into the X and the Y chromosome, it's, it's much, much lower. So we're not seeing the same level of Y variation that Vinga was originally. Um, but uh, he's now working with sequence data from uh, multiple males from each of the up and the down selected lines um, to do a GWAS plus testosterone measurements. So stay tuned. So the hope is that we actually map out the, the actual physical location of this variation to try and understand how male specific variability can be encoded with the genome. And if I have time, I just want to tell one more story of how the Y chromosome actually can encode male variation. And it's this species called Facilia peri. So this is some work by Ben Sankam. Facilia peri is almost impossible to breed in the lab, but people have noticed for a really long time that when they go out to the field, um, 
uh, to places like Guyana or Suriname, you get five different types of males that exist in the same population. And these males differ enormously in, in mating behavior. So some of them are sneakers, some of them are wooers, some of them are coercive maters. They differ enormously in size. So this little one here is a female mimic and it looks like a tiny juvenile female. Um, this one here with the, the bars on its tail is the biggest of, of all five of the males. Um, and they have different sperm morphology, all sorts of different things. Um, they are also passed, each of these phenotypes is passed perfectly and completely from father to son. And that consists that, that suggests that there are five Y haplotypes um, that are maintained through balancing selection in these populations. And this is some field work from Guyana. This is our field assistant, someone in France. And he, in one scoop of these ditches, can pull out many males. These, they're very high density in these eutrophic uh, ditches. But importantly, you can pull out all five types of males in a single scoop um, from these ditches. Um, and so they're present in the same population. And as I said before, non-recombining regions are thought to have really low adaptive potential. So how can you get these complex phenotypes that have to be polygenic evolving um, in non-recombining Y chromosomes? And as I said before, um, Perry has the same type of Y chromosome as Picta. So now I'm showing you here the male-female coverage at the top of each of the five different males in a different color. And you can see that each of the five shows the same pattern of massive degeneration outside that limited par. And the average is the same um, as Picta, which is at the bottom shown in green. And so we thought, well, maybe, maybe the five morphs evolved on the ancestral sex chromosome before it stopped recombining, right? And maybe it was just lost in Picta. That would sort of explain what was going on here. You could have this sort of predating the origin of recombination suppression. And they've just been lost in Picta. And so um, Ben uh, used what's called a Kamer approach. So if you think about the genome in females and males as being composed of sort of three pieces, you've got autosomes that are present in the same, they're, they're, they're present in the same dose in both sexes, the X chromosome in gray, which is present in both sexes, but in different dose. And you've got the Y chromosome here in green that's male specific. And bioinformatically, you can divide up your sequence data into what are called KMERS. They're just short words. We use 31 MERS because that's the easiest. Uh, it's, it's a size that doesn't seem to melt down the, the computing cluster, um, anything smaller, and it becomes really problematic. Um, so if you divide up your reference genome or your read data or whatever into KMERS of 31 base pairs and you subtract out anything that's present in females from the male genome, so you remove all the KMERS that are present in both sexes, you're left with, in theory, things that are just present on the Y. And Andy Clark years ago called these Ymers. And you can take your Ymers and you can do all sorts of different things to them. You can map them back to your Lumina reads, your scaffolds and your haplotypes and, and assemble Y sequence. Ben did that, but more importantly, he treated each of these Weimers as a phylogenetic character. So he took um, Kamers that were present in two or more males, but absent in all females, and he created a big presence absence matrix of them. And just using sort of parsimony, built a phylogeny on that Kamer abundance and uh, presence. And he found that first off, the different morphs, which are shown here, all clustered together. Um, so you get the immaculata morphs all clustering together, the perimorphs all clustering together, the melanzona, which are the stripy ones, seem to be a little bit more variable, um, but we still see pretty good clustering outside of this group here. But most importantly, Picta is a very clear outgroup, um, suggesting that these morphs actually evolved after recombination suppression um, and after the ancestor uh, with Picta. So they seem to be unique to Perry, suggesting a really high level of Y adaptive potential. And this is something that he's trying to figure out how it could possibly be. So he's working on the, the Y coding content of these five different morphs at the moment. And with that, I need to thank the lab um, who are super fun to work with. And we've recently turned off Zoom for all our meetings and it's just been a joy to be back in person with all of them. A lot of the work uh, that I talked about was done by people who recently left um, and they're sorely missed. Um, 
the people we work with, uh, notably uh, Nicholas Colm and Felix Breeden, without whom this work would not have been possible, the people who pay us. And I need to give a quick shout out to the people who did a lot of the scientific graphics and illustrations that I use. So um, the science graphics, uh, the pretty ones, um, were done by Jocelyn Shu, who is an amazing graphic designer. She loves science communication. She also happens to moonlight as my lab manager, but she's taking commissions and she does great work and she's super fun to do illustrations with. So I encourage you to reach out to her if you have a graphic that you need done. Claire Lacey is a London-based illustrator. Her whole goal, professional at least, is to do um, to make beautifully drafted but biologically accurate illustrations. And she was actually an artist in residence with us for a year and was just lovely. And she did all the, the fish illustrations that I used. And thanks again for hanging around and to Lisa for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's uh, the problem with Zoom, of course, is that we're not all there in person to give you a round of applause. So I do, yes, thank you. I encourage people to give the little emojis. Um, so, you know, I can spell genetics. That's pretty much my limitation but I do have a couple questions but I'm gonna so please do please people please because that also made my head spin a little bit that was also good just because my it makes my head spin doesn't mean it makes everybody else's head spin so I'm gonna ask you Fa Faustina's question first unless Faustina you want to ask your question out loud and then I will get to mine my questions. I, I do actually have some. Uh, and if I still oh. oh, good. Okay. Hi, Dr. Judith Mark. Thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed every bit of your presentations. They're really amazing. I just have a quick question to ask you because on the part of your presentation, uh, there was a part you kind of explained about methylation, like mm -hmm. uh, methylation of the other gene. So the purpose of using this methylation process is it to to enable ones to detect the presence of uh, the presence of the genes or the replication process of the of the gene. So methylation is a way to sort of modify the gene, yes. right? Yes. Turn on expression or to turn it off. And yes. in a context I was talking about, males seem to have much less methylation on yes. the X chromosome, and that's consistent with the idea that sort of the structure of the X might be more open. So if you yeah. hypomethylated, it kind of creates a, a, a more open and chromatin structure, and that might make it easier for the transcriptional machinery to attach. So this is sort of how we think um, dosage compensation works in flies. So it's sort of consistent with that mechanism. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, so when it attaches, it makes us to easily detect it, that, okay, this is where it is. So, and then we- put Well, I mean, methylation doesn't tell you much, except that there's a methyl group on this, the sequence. So you yeah. have to sort of look at your gene model, how yeah. you've annotated the gene and see if it's at the CPG, you know, start site or, you know, where that methylation is. So it doesn't tell you where the gene is, but it tells you how the gene might be regulated in a way. And then replicate, can I say? I don't know that it tells us too much about replication either, um, okay. but you might know more about that than I do. I'm not very good on my cell cycle, to be honest. No, I really honor everything. I honor everything you presented today and I really appreciate your time. And thanks for answering my question. Thanks for the question. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Vestima. Uh, please do write any other questions that you have in the chat. Um, so I have some questions, if I can read my writing. Uh, I does the does the um, does the extent of Y degeneration um, and uh, compensate or the compensate compensation does that with the Y with the X right because mm -hmm. there's compensation does that ever or do you look or do you know does it ever change any like uh, indications of sex difference in phenotype? I think that's a great question. So. In mammals, right, X is inactivated in females, one X. And right. so you, for, uh, I mean, for some phenotypes, you do get sex differences based on methylation, like calico coloring in cats, right? Mm -hmm. So you can in females. Um, I don't know how it would affect in systems where it's the X being hypertranscribed in males, like you see in Drosophila. I don't know how that affects, I can't think of how that would affect 
um, sex specific phenotypes um, as directly, except that it, it basically sex specific phenotypes in are, are much more often associated with with Y chromosomes. So it sort of fosters the evolution of a Y. You know, dosage compensation permits more of the Y to become male specific, right? Um, so let me. So evolutionary concept uh, in, in an evolutionary framework, if you have complete dosage compensation of the X, that relieves pressure on the Y chromosome to maintain gene sequence and integrity just through dosage sensitivity. And it's in those systems that the Y, the non-recombining region can expand and the Y can essentially become a bigger proportion of the chromosome, right? So it could work in that sense, but not in a more, in the more direct sense that I think you're asking about. No, yeah, I'm asking in a more direct sense. Yeah, but it's, I'm sure it's an example that I'm not thinking of here. No, no, um, no. I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I'm not thinking of any specific example. I was just thinking, I, is there any, um, and this is a completely, uh, maybe I should ask the, the, the uh, a, a question that I shouldn't be too embarrassed at first, which is why the liver and muscle, right? You had a, I can't remember. Oh, because it was easy for us to get. Oh. So these fish are really little. Okay. And, um, it's actually quite hard to get enough tissue from some organs um, to do RNA seq without all sorts of, you know, mm -hmm. expensive shenanigans. No. So liver is really easy to get. There's a lot of muscle that we can pull off. Um, so those were the easiest ones. Those are the easiest somatic tissues for us to collect, essentially. But you said there was more and uh, more that you detected in the liver and the muscle than in the godad, which was kind of surprising. Yeah. Well, so in almost every species that has complete dosage compensation, it only affects somatic tissue. Mm. Uh, so the gonad is never dosage compensated. And that's what Dave was really showing with that. Yeah. Um, I also thought this is just more of a comment. I mean, you kept saying something about like, it's so surprising that it's less than 4 million years. Like to some of us, 4 million years is a long time. I know, but I'm an evolutionary biologist. I'm actually, it's worse. I'm a population geneticist and that's nothing at all. <laughs> right. That's a very short period of time. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, I see. Um, and now my uh, crazy question is, and I swear I've seen this. So, but maybe it's maybe not quite perfect. I'm sorry if you can hear the workers in the background. Um, does, why degeneration, you might have heard that, um, exist in uh, like is it in humans and does it change with age? That's my question. Ah, uh, so yes and yes. So the human Y has what twenty seven genes and the X has about eight hundred. So they've lost the vast vast majority of the genes um, and they are homologous to the X. They were once the same chromosome, the same pair. Um, so since recombination was suppressed in the ancestor of the Therian and the of the, of, the, of the marsupials and the placentals, they've lost the 90% of coding sequence. There is some evidence that it has males age, some cells through non-disjunction can lose their Y, they can get multiple copies of the Y, all sorts of things can happen. And the Y in, in mammals contains these massive palindromes. So it actually recombines with itself. Mm. And that process, can really screw things up. Mm -hmm. um, so you can get some cells where you've got, you know, uh, big duplications of chunks of the Y and, and multiple copies of the genes in them and some where those have been deleted. So you get lots of variation in the Y uh, as a cell ages um, through that lineage. So it's, it's super weird. It's super weird. <laughs> it's like it defies the law of mitosis and meiosis to some extent. Yeah. I just, I, when I first heard that, I, I just, I was really suspicious that it was some kind of, you know, misinformation that I was reading. And then I pubmed it and I saw that there, yeah. Yeah, um, all sorts of weird things happen. Uh, so my other question that I, I didn't write down, um, but was in my head is just why, because you asked at the very beginning, but I'm not positive you answered it which is why and I don't know that there's an answer to it but why why have x's and y's or z's and w's when we don't need them? yeah so there's a lot of theories about it and not a lot of data so um 
one thing that you get from X's and Y's is a pretty even sex ratio, right? That's sometimes beneficial. Yeah. Um, not always, like species that do it through environment, they definitely do not have even sex ratios. Um, there is a longstanding theory actually dating to that, that work by Fisher in the thirties that suggests that that non-recombining region. So, you know, in the puffer fish example, where it's all a snip, there's no reason for recombination to be suppressed between the X and the Y, right? You've yeah. got the snip, you're good. But if you have a nearby gene that has some sort of sex specific effect, say color in guppies, in males, right? Color can be thought of as sort of sexually antagonistic. So in males, they're super colorful. They're very attractive to females, but they're also very attractive to predators. So they may have more kids, even though they have a shorter lifespan. If you're colorful and you're a female, males don't care. So there's no fitness benefit, but you will be more rapidly predated. So if you put that gene on a Y chromosome in a non-recombining region next to the sex determining gene, you'll only have it present in males. So it'll never be present in females and selected against, and it will only be present in individuals that have the male determining gene. So that non-recombining region may actually expand to encompass genes that have, nearby genes that have benefits in males, right? And at that point, nothing's fallen apart yet, right? It takes a while for gene sequence and gene activity to degrade evolutionarily. And so it may be that this degeneration is just a consequence of that. That's super hard to prove empirically. So the theory works, it makes total sense. And mathematically, it's really clear. Proving that is super hard because we don't have a lot of genes that where we know they have different effects in fitness in males and females. Mm -hmm. um, and so, there's not a huge amount of evidence for or against, to be honest. Uh, and then a tongue in the cheek question, unless somebody has a really an important question, which is uh, really good, Lisa. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. Uh, the uh, what's always so super fascinating is you know colorful birds, colorful fish uh, are the males, right? And that is coveted in the avian and the uh, fish scene, <laughs> sex scene, but isn't it the opposite in humans? I mean, yeah, humans are weird, but I mean, yeah. I know we're weird, but it just seems- Well, like but we're, we're really weird in how much care our offspring require, right? And so I'm not an anthropologist by any means, but the thinking is that we're sort of sex reversed compared to other animals in a way because females actually need to attract and retain a mate to help raise that super expensive baby. And they have to do it even through pregnancy, right? Um, and so the idea, the thinking is, and I'm, this is all super yeah. sexist and yeah, so slightly incorrect. Like, and I, I apologize in but, advance, like, you know, <laughs> Early, yeah. early human evolution, not now, yes. um, but you had to sort of maintain these, these traits um, to sort of attract and retain a mate who yeah, would help you raise this very expensive baby. I totally get that, but it doesn't work because, you know, uh, men can grow their hair too, right? And there wasn't makeup back then. But we're less concerned about, the, I mean, there are some male traits that very much are sexually selected. Right, so not, there are some that men, males look at and females as part of, you know, a smooth skin, a lack of wrinkles, uh, teeth, hair, whatever. There are some traits that, you know, were also selected in males, like females looking for, this is super politically incorrect, good providers, good hunters, I'm really sorry about this. Um, so it goes sort of both ways in that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've always just found it so fascinating that, um, you know, they are really old. Um, sorry, not, not that old is bad, right? Old is not obsolete. They're, they're, I'm not trying to say because I'm old. I'm not trying to put myself out of the job. But that, you know, maybe we need a different perspective now to try and think like what you know, uh, they're just so stories, right? It's really hard to to yeah. to um, draw conclusions. But uh, I'm just wondering a little bit more about like thinking about it. The the other part that's always fascinated me is, and we're running out of time, but the idea of 
um, you know, uh, the SRY in, in humans and that, you know, we know so much about male differentiation, but we know very little about females and the females are default, blah, blah, blah. But it turns out actually, no, there's an active process that is involved in female differentiation as well. And so, um, and that is really the, the fault of um, paying so much attention to the male side without paying attention to the female. So, you know, yeah. I wonder how much more we can learn with like sort of re- uh, yeah if you, and, and actually sexual selection theory when women started working on it completely changed so it changed from this model of males actually competing for females to what's now termed cryptic female choice so females have a lot more say in a lot of these things it's just that it's it's not as ostentatious as two deer battling it out or something like that and so, and, you film that too. yeah but that only happened once you had you know people with a different perspective coming into the field and saying let's let's right. think about this a little bit more. that's why diversity matters right exactly well um thank you very much i see that it's exactly time and it was really fascinating you opened my mind you know i don't know if you hypomethylated it or not but um <laughs> so there must be some methylation patterns that have changed and i really appreciate uh you taking the time Thanks so much for the invitation, Lisa, and I hope to see you when you're in Vancouver next. I guess I'll definitely let you know. Bye. Bye.